Do Islamists control Britain? Well, following Islamist threats to politicians, the Conservative MPs Lee Anderson and Suella Braverman have been accused of Islamophobia for suggesting that this could be the case. And Lee is even being investigated for hate crime by London's Mayor Sadiq Khan's police force for suggesting that Sadiq is under the thumb of Islamists himself. Although, I've never understood their revulsion at Islamophobia. Nobody gives people with arachnophobia a hard time, and all spiders do is sometimes pop out around the house and scare you. If Osama bin Laden came scuttling out from under the couch, I can totally understand people not liking it. I think it's the legs, they're so spindly, and the fact he's been dead for 13 years. Of course people are going to want to swipe him away with a rolled up newspaper. And if you turned on the bathroom light and found Abu Hamza in your bath, unable to climb out because his hooks don't give him any purchase on the shiny sides, you'd probably soil your underpants yourself. How are you going to get a bit of card under him, jiggle him up into a pint glass and put him in the garden? He's 21 stone. I can understand people being apprehensive. And spiders just want to make a little web and catch some flies. They haven't been mobbing the streets of our cities calling for jihad. <laughs> and the extermination of Jews, they haven't desecrated war memorials, they haven't sent teachers into hiding for displaying cartoons, they haven't attacked authors for blasphemy or flown planes into skyscrapers or tried to establish a global caliphate or detonated bombs at pop concerts. Islamists are definitely a bit scarier than spiders. But according to the lefty mainstream, the problem isn't Islamists or arachnids, it's far-right extremists. The white fundamentalists, the people the, the rise of the extreme right. Obviously. But anyway, I digress. The current furore about Islamists being in control of Britain came to a head last week when political decisions were made in the Houses of Parliament to appease Islamists who'd violently threatened members of that parliament. And when I say threats, these were pretty serious. Conservative MP Tobias Elwood's home was targeted. Labour MP Preet Gill said that I've had direct death threats. It seems like it's become a norm. Other MPs have had horrible threats to their families. MP Mike Freer's offices were firebombed. And a couple of years ago, MP Sir David Amos was stabbed to death by Islamist Ali Harby Ali, who said he had no regrets and that he killed Sir David to send a message to Sir David's colleagues. A message that seems to be received loud and clear given that our parliament is now bending the rules to appease these threats. So what exactly happened in Parliament? It's pretty complicated, but basically a provincial opposition party, the Scottish National Party, asked for a vote on a ceasefire in Gaza that was pretty hardcore anti-Israel, didn't blame Hamas and would lead to Britain using its position on the United Nations Security Council to vote for an immediate ceasefire and halting of the sale of arms to Israel. The SNP called this vote to expose divisions in the Labour Party, whose politicians have been split over calling for a ceasefire and supporting Israel's right to defend itself. Labour politicians who'd received threats were worried that if they voted against the SNP's hardline motion, they'd be at risk from Islamists, even though they didn't want to vote for it because it's so hardline and is against the party line. So apparently under pressure from Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer, although he denies it, the Speaker of the House, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, tore up the parliamentary rulebook and scrapped the SNP vote and instead allowed a vote on a watered-down Labour amendment so that Labour MPs could still be seen as calling for a ceasefire and thus avoid being beheaded. In short, democracy was subverted and political decisions were made to appease Islamists, sending a pretty dangerous message that, hey, threatening politicians really works and they should do more of it. Not only that, but in the fallout, anyone who said, hmm, Maybe it sets a bad precedent to bow to Islamists and let them force political decisions under threat of violence got called racist and Islamophobic. Lee Anderson accused the left-wing London mayor Sadiq Khan of being under the control of his Islamist mates and was promptly kicked out of the Tory party. Well, is Sadiq under the control of Islamists, as Lee Anderson suggests? Let's have a look at the evidence. Sadiq is in charge of London's police force, who have been remarkably permissive in their policing of anti-Israel riots, allowing anti-Semitic chants, the intimidation of Jews, and a genocidal slogan to be projected onto the side of Big Ben. When Islamist group Hizb ut Tahrir, I'm not buffering, that's what they're called, marched in London calling Hamas heroes and calling for Muslim armies to commence jihad. Jihad! 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 that the Muslim armies move to rescue the people of Palestine. That is the solution. Khan's police force released a statement saying, well, the word jihad has a number of meanings, yet yeah, none of them particularly cuddly. 
Bear in mind, people in the West can get arrested for racist hate crime for putting up stickers saying it's okay to be white, so there are obvious double standards here. But Sadiq's police force do take action when people counter-protest against the anti-Israel riots, such as this Iranian man who waved a banner critical of Hamas, or when people criticise Palestinian flags, or wave Union Jacks, or criticise the protests in any way. And Sadiq allows thousands of Palestinian flags to be flown from state property across London, a clear signal that the land has been captured. And I couldn't find any mention by Sadiq of the arson attack on the offices of his rival MP Mike Freer, who dropped out of politics as a result of the arson attack and won't be criticising Sadiq's actions anymore. But of course none of this means that Sadiq is under the control of Islamists or that they're his mates, even if there is an outward appearance of Islamists helping him by removing his political opponents. However, Sadiq has long-standing connections to Islamists. As a lawyer, Sadiq was consulted for the defence of Zakarias Masuai. Here he is with Masuai's mum. Masuai is the only person to be convicted in the US for the 9-11 terror attacks, although obviously there's no implication that lawyers share their clients' opinions and every Everyone deserves representation. Still, it's an interesting choice of client, and I couldn't find any evidence of Sadiq acting as a lawyer for a white supremacist convicted of a terror offence. I wonder what it is about Islamic terrorists that make his pee pee go dingling. He's represented or shared a stage with loads of them. In 2003, Sadiq attended a first captive conference in London to advocate for the release of terror suspects held in Guantanamo Bay. The event was organised by the Islamic Observation Centre run by Yasser al Siri, who claimed asylum in the UK after being sentenced to death in Egypt for the attempted assassination of the Egyptian Prime Minister, which missed its target but killed a 12 year old old schoolgirl named Shaima instead. A common theme amongst Islamists seems to be that Muslim children dying is only seen as bad when Israel is involved. Al-Siri was also a member of the militant Islamist group Islamic Jihad. But hey, let's give Sadiq the benefit of the doubt. The guy probably only killed one 12 year old girl. Sadiq also appeared on stage with Sajil Abu Ibrahim, a member of the Saudi Arabian militant Islamist group al Mahajurun. Sajil ran a terrorist training camp in Pakistan which trained Mohammed Sadiq Khan, one of the London 7-7 bombers. Still, now that he's mayor of London, I'm sure Sadiq will take extra care not to rub shoulders with the people who train terrorists to attack Londoners. Sadiq also spoke 90 times alongside Imam Suleiman Ghani, who's reported in the Times as having joined a campaign for an Islamic State and holidayed in Afghanistan, posing for photos with the Taliban and giving an interview with the Taliban's own TV channel. And while Sadiq was chairman of human rights group Liberty, he attended four events by Stop Political Terror, a group supported by Anwar al awlaki an extremist imam and Al-Qaeda recruiter. But look, Sadiq just repeatedly shares microphones and lunches with these people. It doesn't necessarily mean they're his mates. Although in Sadiq's defence, as a Labour whip, he helped push through a government proposal to increase the detention of those suspected of terror offences to 42 days without charge. So if he does have any pro-Islamist sentiments, he can put them into one side when it advances his political career. I respect that in a politician. And in fairness, Sadiq has denounced Islamism, not just after Islamist terror attacks like the Parsons Green bombing in London or the Manchester Arena bombing, but also after a fatal attack by an anti-Muslim extremist on worshippers at the Finsbury Park Mosque. This is a time when you'd think he'd legitimately just slam far-right extremists, so let's give him his dues. Fair play Sadiq. That's Jews with a D by the way. Is the rest of Britain under the thumb of Islamists? Well they sometimes act like it. Mainstream politicians always tie themselves in knots to divert away from the elephant in the room and blame far-right extremists, racists and white supremacists instead. Look at Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker of the House, the guy who subverted democracy to appease Islamists who are threatening politicians. Who does he blame? Mike Freer said uh, you can't divorce anti-Semitism from the threats and attacks he's faced. Do, do, do you agree with that framing? Is that the, the key risk and cause at the moment? We've lots of risk and we've lots of people who don't. Whether it's people who are white fundamentalists, the people there, the rise of the extreme right, it was the extreme right. Every time. This is because our politicians don't just live in fear from Islamists, they live in fear from the left-wing mainstream, which deems any hint of racism or Islamophobia to be the greatest sin and will destroy careers and reputations over it. The fear of looking racist is behind so much evil. The grooming gangs weren't apprehended because authorities were afraid of being accused of racism. And a security guard at the Manchester Arena didn't stop the Ariana Grande concert bomber because he was afraid of looking racist. 
so the threat from Islamism is played down. Commentators like Peter Oborn say it's a right-wing myth with no evidence. I guess Peter thinks that Lee Rigby's head spontaneously detached itself. Peter Oborn writes for Middle East Eye, which is funded by Qatar and apparently backs the militant Islamist group the Muslim Brotherhood. It's always interesting to peek behind the curtain and see where the money's coming from, because even respected journalists sometimes like big wads of cash more than telling the truth. Peter has described the Muslim Brotherhood as a brave organisation and also said that the victims of grooming gangs had accepted the advances of their attackers, which is an interesting way to look at child sexual exploitation. Mainstream journalist Tim Walker says he's not aware of any Islamism when he's walking around London, ergo it must not exist. I'm not aware of any burglary when I walk around London, ergo burglary must be a far right myth too. Although one time I was travelling around London and I got stuck underground because a train in front of me had been blown up by Islamists, which made me quite aware of it that day. Other commentators say that the fear of Islamism is overblown. Well how hard are we allowed to blow before we're committing a hate crime? According to mainstream commentators, the threat to MPs from Islamists is so serious the Speaker had to upend parliamentary procedure and subvert democracy to appease it, but the real problem is far-right extremists, even though they haven't actually done anything. But also, the Islamist threat is being blown out of proportion by right-wing bigots because they're racist, and even though there's stacks of evidence of Islamist killings, arson attacks and threats, there's no evidence, but also MPs need more protection from these threats because they're literally quitting their jobs because of these Islamist threats, which don't exist. Somebody, please make it make sense! It's reminiscent of the aftermath of the killing of Sir David Amos when MPs blamed online harms, social media and emails, even though the killer hadn't been radicalised by a WhatsApp meme group that got out of hand. Norm Macdonald nailed it perfectly when he mocked the only accepted opinion on Islamism. What terrifies me is if ISIS were to detonate a nuclear device and kill 50 million Americans, imagine the backlash against peaceful Muslims. What is Islamophobia anyway? Since the Hamas attacks of October the 7th, large increases in Islamophobia have been reported. Muslims have reported feeling afraid to leave the house, which raises the concern. If Muslims feel afraid to leave the house, who's going to make Jews feel afraid to leave the house? I'm joking, I'm not suggesting all Muslims are anti-Semitic. According to a survey by the ADL, only 54% of British Muslims are. Here's a video of a British synagogue being threatened by a mob. Baroness Warsai jumped on Lee Anderson and the Tory party to accuse them of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism. It'd be interesting to know which race she thinks Muslims are because I was under the impression it was a religion and you got all shades of Muslims, including lots of gingers for some reason. I think there's some sort of connection with the virgins. The Guardian has the apparently shocking revelation that more than half of Tories think that Islam is a threat to the British way of life, while only 18% believe that the two are compatible. But is this hatred? Aren't these just valid concerns? You wouldn't chastise an Aztec for being concerned about the impact of Spanish immigration on the Tenochtitlan way of life. And it's not as if these views are based on prejudice, they're based on observable fact of what's happened in countries such as Lebanon when Islamists became predominant, and what's happened in this country already. Terror attacks, hate preachers, huge marches calling for jihad, grooming gangs that target children seen as fair game because they're infidels, blasphemous authors assaulted, teachers sent into hiding, films cancelled. I can't help but feel that if Islamists were dealt with and the threats, violence, anti-semitism, censorship and bigotry ended, Islamophobia would also evaporate. Because to be honest there's been a very visible rise of Islamism in the UK, thrown into stark relief by the anti-Israel marches. Suddenly the mainstream palliatives for mass immigration, multiculturalism is great, we'll all get along somehow, mmm nummy food, went out the window as we saw huge mobs running rampant, desecrating war memorials and generally behaving in a way that's not very British. Well, unless we've gone to watch a football game in a French town. In our defence, at least we're drunk when we're chucking plastic chairs into the town fountain. The numbers have always been there in the data. The UK's intelligence agency MI5 have 43,000 extremists on their watch list and 90% are Islamist terror suspects. As this graph shows, there are far more Islamist prisoners than right-wing prisoners at the moment. And instead of tackling it at its roots, authorities turn a blind eye to Islamism and even fund it as they did when the government funded the notorious Green Lane Mosque in Birmingham that hosted hate preachers. See my video on that by the way, there's a link in the blurb below. And any organisation set up to tackle terrorism inevitably gets dragged to the left by the progressive cabal that runs the public services in the UK. Prevent, the UK's anti-terror organisation, have been criticised for being too focused on right-wing extremists who mainly seem to be autistic teenagers 
users who've downloaded some banned document from the dark web rather than being a credible threat to society. I believe we should protect people, protect Muslims from hatred, but allow ideas to be criticised. Islamophobia is a word invented to stop scrutiny or criticism of Islam by making it akin to racism or xenophobia, which is an easy link as Islam didn't originate in Britain. But Islam isn't a race, it's a religion, and Islamism is a political ideology that wants to reorder society and government according to religious laws. It's been tried in places like Iran and Afghanistan, and I strongly recommend that progressives visit those countries in a gay pride bikini before coming to their final conclusion on the merits of Islamism. Of course, the great Christopher Hitchens saw all of this coming. This is very urgent business, ladies and gentlemen, I beseech you. Resist it while you still can, and before the right to complain is taken away from you, which will be the next thing, you will be told you can't complain because you're Islamophobic. The term is already being introduced into the culture as if it was an accusation of race hatred, for example, or, or, or bigotry, whereas it's only the objection to the preachings of a very extreme and absolutist religion. Watch out for these symptoms. They are just symptoms of surrender very often ecumenically offered to you by men of God in other robes, Christian and Jewish and smarmy ecumenical. These are the, these are the ones who hold open the gates mm -hmm. for the barbarians. The barbarians never take a city till someone <coughs> holds Hoping the gates get. open for them. And it's your own preachers who will do it for you and your own multicultural authorities who will do it for you. Resist, resist it while you can. Hitchens warned us that the term Islamophobia would be used to stop scrutiny or criticism and hold open the gates of Western civilization, and now we can see that happening in real time. People get called racist a lot more than they get called wrong. It's easier to call someone racist than it is to explain why they're wrong, and if they're right, then calling them racist is the only thing you can do. In these fevered times, with hysterical progressives ready to point and scream, Islamophobe, like a Salem teenager finding a witch, why would anyone question Islamism, when at best you'll be called a racist and at worst you could be beheaded? Far-right extremists, if you can find any because they're surprisingly hard to find despite being the greatest threat to democracy apparently, well far-right extremists must be looking at the trick Islam has pulled and saying, wow, how do we do that for our ideology? Can they invent Nazi-phobia and then anyone who questions them is an anti-Nazi racist? And can they get government-funded mosques where they can have hate preachers like Hitler and have big mobs screaming for the elimination of Israel and Jews? Well, I guess that last one is already allowed. You just have to be waving the right flag. Sadiq might not be in the grip of Islamists, but he's enthralled to a worse cabal, leftists. The British progressive left have formed a bizarre alliance with Islamists, clearly visible in the anti-Israel marches. Funnily enough, this is exactly what happened in Iran, leading up to the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Although, since the Marxists helped them to take power, the Islamists have been a bit slow in making it Iran a magical progressive haven for LGBTQ youth. But everywhere you look in Britain, leftists are shilling for Islamism. Comedian Frankie Boyle tweeted, If I see the word Islamist, I just assume I'm about to read the incoherent ramblings of a massive racist. But when challenged to post a picture of the Prophet Muhammad to prove that Islamism isn't a problem, he went quiet. And are the hyper-progressive SNP under the control of Islamists? I don't know, but I wish they cared as much about Scotland as they do about Gaza. They put forward motions in the Houses of Parliament to stop people dying in Gaza, even though the life expectancy is lower in Glasgow. And Islamist views seem to be accepted across our leftist public sector, such as when the Ministry of Justice hosted a guest speaker who told Jews to get in the queue behind Muslims. I'm not sure what they're queuing up for. Hummus, maybe? They both like hummus. And a judge who decided not to punish three women who glorified Hamas militants at a protest was revealed to have been openly anti-Semitic on social media, which doesn't bode well for the impartiality of our judiciary. You'll hear a lot of people say that demographics is destiny, and there's an assumption that because of mass immigration from Muslim countries and a higher birth rate in Muslim communities, at some point in the future, they'll be in the majority and will take power. In reality, they don't need a majority. A motivated minority can and will exert power over a disenfranchised majority. Intimidation of politicians is part of that, and I think we're seeing that with the cultural hijacking of Marxist trends such as DEI and the invention of Islamophobia as a concept to silence criticism of Islamism. People have their head in the sand. Jewish pressure groups such as the ADL monitor and criminalize every possible thing that far-right groups do, 
but ignore the growth of Islamism, even though it poses a slightly bigger existential threat to Jews than a white guy with a few stickers. And if we're being real, when the poop hits the fan, it'll be right-wing men who'll be defending Jews. I can see within a generation support for Israel withering in the West as young leftists come of age and Islamists grow in number and confidence. People can scream racism or Islamophobia all they like, but history is full of lessons. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and share this video with your local MP. And if you want to support me making these videos, you can become a Patreon. From as little as £3 a month, you get access to exclusive content. And all my other videos are on there that you might want to check out, such as one about the Green Lane Mosque scandal and another one on political Islam. Okay, thanks for listening. I've been Luke Kears. Goodbye. Bye-bye.